St. Elizabeth of Hungary, Chapter 10. Two years had hardly passed away since Elizabeth had received, with the habit of St. Francis, strength to run with giant steps the remainder of her course when her heavenly bridegroom called her home. One night, towards the close of the year 1231, as Elizabeth lay upon her bed in prayer, our Lord appeared to her in the midst of a soft, bright light, and said, in a voice of ineffable sweetness, "'Come, Elizabeth, my bride, my tender friend, my well-beloved, come with me into the tabernacle which I have prepared for thee from all eternity. I myself will lead thee hither.' On awakening, she hastened, full of joy at her approaching deliverance, to make every preparation for her departure. She made arrangements for her burial, paid a last visit to her poor, and divided everything she possessed between them and her attendants. Master Conrad was suffering at the time from a severe illness, and sent word to her to come to him. He received her with much affection, and when she lamented his sufferings, he said, "'What will become of you, my lady and dear daughter, when I am gone? How will you regulate your life? Who will protect you against the wicked, and who will direct you on your way to heaven?' But she answered, Your anxiety, father, is needless, for I shall die before you, and shall never want any protector other than yourself. On the fourth day after this conversation, she felt the first approach of the sickness which was to set her free. She was obliged to take to her bed, where she remained for about a fortnight, suffering from a raging fever, but calm and joyous in spirit as usual, and absorbed almost continually in prayer. At the end of this time, as she was apparently asleep, one of her women, named Elizabeth, who was sitting by her bed, heard a sweet and exquisite melody which seemed to issue from her throat. The saint just then changed her position, and turning toward her companion, said, "'Where art thou, my beloved?' "'Here,' replied the servant, adding, "'Oh, madam, how sweetly have you been singing!' "'What?' said Elizabeth. "'Did you hear anything?' And on her reply, the saint continued, "'I will tell thee how it was. A beautiful little bird came and perched between me and the wall, and he sang to me for a long time together, so sweetly that I could not help singing too. He revealed to me that I am to die in the course of three days. From that moment she refused to admit any seculars to visit her.' She took leave of those whom she was accustomed to receive and gave them her blessing for the last time. She kept no one with her but her women, some religious who were especially attached to her, her confessor, and the poor leprous girl whom she had adopted in the place of the bright and beautiful children whom she had given up to God. When she was asked why she thus excluded everyone from her presence, she answered, I wish to be alone with God and to meditate on the dreadful day of judgment and my almighty judge. Then she began to weep and implore the mercy of God. On Sunday, the 18th of November, 1231, being the vigil of St. Martin, after Matin, she confessed to Master Conrad, who was sufficiently recovered to be able to hear her. She took her heart in her hands, says a contemporary historian, and read all that was to be read therein, but there was nothing which had not been washed away over and over again by the waters of true contrition. Conrad then asked her directions with regard to her property. I wonder, said she, that you should ask me such a question. You know that when I made a vow of obedience to you, I renounced all my possessions as well as my will, my dear children, and all the pleasures of this world. I have kept nothing except by your command to pay debts and do alms. I should have wished, had you permitted me, to renounce all and to live in a cell upon the daily bread which other poor people would have allowed me. For a long time past, everything which I seem to possess has in actuality belonged to the poor. Distribute then among them everything that I leave behind, except this old worn habit in which I wish to be buried. I make no will, for I have no heir but Jesus Christ. But as one of her companions begged for something as a remembrance, she gave him the old cloak of St. Francis, which had been sent her by the Pope. I leave thee my mantle, said she. Despise it not because it is old and patched and worn. It is the most precious jewel which I have ever possessed. I tell thee that whenever I have wished to obtain any special grace from my dearest Jesus, I have had nothing to do but to wear this mantle while I made my petition, and it was sure to be granted. She then begged to be buried in the church of the hospital which she had built and dedicated to St. Francis. After she had conversed for a long time with her confessor and had heard Mass, she received the last sacraments with an ineffable joy, fully known only to him who thus visited her, but manifested in some measure to all who were present by the supernatural brightness of her countenance. She then remained silent and motionless until the hour of Vespers, when her lips were unlocked to pour forth a flood of heavenly eloquence, the more marvelous to all who heard from her, her wanted silence and reserve. She recited at length the whole narrative of the resurrection of Lazarus, and dwelt with deep feeling upon our Lord's visit to the mourning sisters, and the deep mystery of his divine tears. Her words were so moving that all present began to weep, when, full as ever of tender sympathy, she addressed them in the words of our Lord to the sorrowing women who followed him to Calvary. Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves. And she sought to soothe her attendants by the most affectionate expressions. My friends, my dearly loved ones, such was the language of her loving heart to the rough, unsympathizing souls by whom Conrad had replaced her devoted Gouda and Isentrude. She had won their love by the continual outpouring of her own. Elizabeth now bowed her head and remained for some time silent, and then, while her lips continued closed, a soft and exquisite melody was again heard in her throat. 
When questioned by those present, she replied, Did you not hear them singing with me? I sang with them as well as I could. Her sweet voice was already mingling with the angels in the new song which is ever sounding before the throne of the Lamb. She remained till near midnight in a state of holy exultation, as if triumphing in her assured victory. But suddenly she exclaimed, What should we do if our enemy the devil were to appear? A moment afterwards she cried in a very loud, clear voice, Fly, fly, evil one, I have renounced thee. She soon added, He is gone, let us now speak of God and his son. Let this not weary you, for it will not be long. At the first cock crowing, she said, This is the hour at which the Blessed Virgin gave birth to our Lord. Let us speak of God, of the infant Jesus, for this is midnight when Jesus was born, when he was laid in the manger, and when he created a new star which was never seen before. This is the hour when he came to redeem the world. He will redeem me also. This is the hour when he raised the dead and delivered the souls which were in bondage. He will deliver mine also out of this miserable world. Her joy seemed to increase every moment. I am weak, said she, but I feel no pain, no more than if I were not ill. I recommend you all to God. Then she said, O oh Mary, come to my aid. The moment has come when God calls his friends to the marriage. The bridegroom comes to seek his bride. Silence! Silence! And as she said these words, she bowed her head and triumphantly breathed forth her last sigh. A sweet perfume immediately filled the humble cabin, and a choir of celestial voices was heard to chant, in ineffable harmony, the sublime response of the church, Regnum Mundi Dei. The kingdom of the world and all its glory I have despised for the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, whom I have seen, whom I have loved, and whom I have believed, whom I have loved. This was on the night of 19th November, 1231. The saint had just completed her 24th year. Hardly had her happy soul entered into its everlasting rest when her body became the object of the pious and enthusiastic devotion of her countrymen. It was arrayed in the poor worn tunic which she had chosen for her winding sheet, and exposed in the humble chapel of her own hospital to the loving and wondering gaze of the faithful. She lay before them in more than mortal beauty. Elizabeth had fallen asleep with the marks of grief and sickness and austerity upon her face, but the touch of death had glorified even her mortal body, and the loving friends of her girlhood, who came once more to look upon her face, felt that not even in the first freshness of her youth, as the happy bride of the good landgrave, or as the joyful mother of his fair children, had she been so radiantly beautiful as now. A delicious fragrance floated around her bier, and on the night preceding her burial, while the office for the dead was chanted, a strange harmony was heard throughout. Several persons left the church to ascertain the cause, and saw a number of birds, of a species never before seen, perched upon the roof of the church, and singing this wondrous melody, as if they would celebrate her obsequies after their own fashion. Some said they were angels who had been sent from God to carry the soul of the dear Saint Elizabeth to heaven, and were now come back to honor her sacred body by their songs of heavenly gladness. These little birds, says Saint Bonaventure, bore witness to her purity by speaking their language at her burial, and singing with this marvelous sweetness over her tomb. He who once spoke by the mouth of an ass to rebuke the madness of a prophet might well speak by the song of birds to proclaim the innocence of a saint. Many remarkable miracles attested the sanctity of a life which scarcely needed them to establish its claim on the homage of Christendom. On the 10th of August, 1232, Siegfried, the Prince Archbishop of Mayence, in whose diocese Marburg was situated, at the request of Master Conrad, consecrated two altars erected in her honor in the church where she was buried. Conrad was busily engaged in collecting the evidence necessary for the process of her canonization when his violent death interposed a delay. Another Conrad, the younger brother of the good landgrave, took up the cause and was the apparently most unlikely instrument of its success. The young prince had become a true penitent, both for his cruelty to his saintly sister and for a course of reckless wickedness by which it had been followed up. He took the cross of the Teutonic Order in the church of the Hospital of St. Francis, founded by St. Elizabeth at Marburg, endowed it with all his possessions in Hesse and Thuringia, and made it one of the principal stations of the Teutonic Order, all in honor of the Landgravine Elizabeth, and in farther reparation for the wrongs done to her when on earth. He devoted all the influence of his princely station and sacred character to obtain a public recognition of her exalted place in heaven. In the spring of the year 1235, Conrad went to the Pope at Perugia, where he had canonized St. Francis seven years before, and besought him to write the name of the Holy Patrician's daughter by his side. After a long and very severe investigation, the petition was granted, and on the Feast of Pentecost of the same year, the hand of Gregory the Ninth, which had already been permitted to inscribe the names of St. Francis of Assisi and St. Antony of Padua in the Catalogue of the Saints, wrote the name of the dear St. Elizabeth beside them. The Bull of Canonization was received with great enthusiasm in Germany. The 1st of May was appointed by the Archbishop of Mayence for the translation of the relics of the saint, and all that was sacred in the church, or exalted in the world, poured into Marburg to do her honor. The Emperor Frederick II, now reconciled with the Pope, 
and at the summit of his glory, came in the humble garb of a penitent to lay his rejected diadem upon the tomb of her who had despised the empire of the world for Christ. Twelve hundred thousand Christians, we are told, gathered round the tomb of the humble Elizabeth and bore back to their homes the tidings of wonders which were wrought there before her eyes. When the coffin was opened, previous to the translation of the sacred body, it was found still to retain the beauty and flexibility in which it had been laid to rest five years before. A sweet perfume exhaled from it, and the spectators saw with amazement a pure and fragrant oil distilled from the remains of her whose mortal life had been embalmed with charity and fragrant with prayer. The oil was carefully preserved, and numerous cures were wrought by its application. The humble servant of the poor was born to the stately resting place prepared for her on the shoulders of the proudest and noblest of the chivalry of Germany, with the emperor at their head. At the offertory he laid a crown of gold upon her shrine, saying, I may not crown her living as my empress, I desire at least to crown her today as an immortal queen in the kingdom of heaven. He then led the young landgrave Hermann to the altar to make his offering, and the empress, Isabella of England, in like manner led the little princesses, Sophia and Gertrude, by the hand. The old landgravine Sophia, with her two sons, Henry and Conrad, followed to do homage to her whose life they had once accounted folly. How must the hearts of those who had been so near to her on earth have swelled and yet trembled within them, as the ora pro nobis sancta Elizabeth Alleluia proclaimed to heaven and earth and hell, that once more the Lord hath put down the mighty from their seat and exalted the humble.